Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's webinar from Spec Innovations, Moving Past Spreadsheets with Modern Requirements Management. My name is Liz Steiner, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Let's go over some quick housekeeping before we get started. During the presentation, feel free to send us questions, and we will get them answered in the question and answer part of the webinar. You can also interact with us on LinkedIn through the Innoslate user group or through Twitter using the handle at Innoslate. The webinar is being recorded and we will make it available to you after the live presentation, so be sure to keep an eye out for it in your inbox. Now I'd like to introduce you to our presenter, Dr. Steve Dam. He'll be discussing with you why you should move past using Microsoft Excel and how to best use modern requirements management tools. Dr. Dam is the president and founder of Spec Innovations, as well as one of our DODAF training instructors. He has been involved with research, experiments, operations analysis, software development, systems engineering, and training for more than 40 years. Dr. Dam participated in the development of the C4ISR architecture framework and DOD architecture framework. He has also received an expert systems engineering professional certification from NCOSI. He currently is applying systems engineering techniques to various DOD, DOE, and commercial projects. Feel free to send Dr. Dan any questions through the LinkedIn user group or send him an email. And now I'll hand over the controls to Dr. Dan and we will get started. Great, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so we're going to talk about a few things, uh, talk about what kind of requirements uh, we're trying to capture starting a little bit about the different levels of requirements and get into a little bit more about, well, why do you need something more than a spreadsheet tool? Why would that be uh, necessary to do this kind of work? And then how can InnoSlate particularly help you improve your requirements management analysis capabilities? Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the requirements themselves and what are we trying to capture? So probably a lot of you are familiar with this concept of where there's a requirements hierarchy. We start with user needs, and those are the capabilities or features identified by a user as being needed to perform the mission. And so what they're trying to do, these are very high level ideas, or abstractions that the users are saying, well, gee, I've got this problem. And so oftentimes that's ill-defined. <laughs> In fact, usually it's very ill-defined, or the user is ha struggles with you know, if things aren't working well, what do I do? So we're going to talk about how to go about getting those user needs and extracting those. But then as you have those high-level needs, you need to create another level of conceptual requirements. And these are still fairly high-level requirements that are generated by the concept development phase. Usually you have an operational requirements document or a concept operations document or something you're building kind of make it just a little bit more fleshing out the ideas and the problem sets and deriving the requirements from, from the user needs. And then you have the system level requirements. Now this is really designed to create at the system level what the, the system needs are. So this becomes a very detailed functional and performance requirements for the system itself. That's still not enough because that's usually too big to go off and buy or build. So what we need to do is get down to the application level and component level where we can look at the specifications that are needed to go off and buy or build something. So different kinds of analyses are needed to go all the way through this set of requirements. It's not simply going and gathering a bunch of things, a bunch of pieces of information and put them in a spreadsheet. As you can see also as you go down, you're you're increasing the number of requirements significantly, sometimes by orders of magnitude. So it, it can be, this can be a very, when you finish at the end, you can have a very large set of requirements, which again makes a spreadsheet kind of approach very difficult. Uh, one of the things is that people have misunderstand a little bit about what is systems engineering. And the systems engineering process, when you look at it, and this is one of the uh, older pictures, the way people look at the process, uh, but if you look at how it, it, it's a bubble, and inside is the actual systems engineering process, and requirements analysis is a piece of that, and then there's functional analysis, allocation, synthesis of the solution. Well, but if you look at what the process inputs and the process outputs are, the process inputs 
start with those user needs, <laughs> basically, and the outputs are basically the next level of specification or set of requirements for that next level down. So if we go back up to this picture, you see at each stage, I'm going to run that process between the user needs, conceptual requirements, run that user needs between the conceptual requirements and system requirements, and then that same systems engineering process to go from system requirements to the applications and components. So what makes this process kind of interesting is that it, it, a lot of people misunderstand it. They think it's a waterfall. They think you've got to start with requirements, work through functional analysis and allocation, and then synthesis. Well, if you look at, there's feedback loops in all this, this picture. And literally, you can start from anywhere within the picture. Um, I have a common picture I use a lot where I say I start middle out, means I start with the functional analysis and allocation, because the, the, the higher level requirements are ill-defined. And I'll talk to that. Um, and so, so that's a key part of it. Um, the the uh, uh, function, so, so, so another thing you could be doing is reverse engineering. You could be looking at well, what's out there today, understanding it in more depth, and then reverse engineering. So you might look at the synthesis or definition of the solution that way. So ultimately, if you, if you look at the steps, can be really executed in any order, or and they're done simultaneously. So there's overlap between them. And the result is functional and non-functional requirements. And I'm sorry, it looks like it's come, cut off a little bit here. Uh, of the uh, of the uh, requirements deck that you need. So, uh, the if you look at the whole life cycle requirements, it's the same idea as what I looked at that hierarchy picture before. So you, you're going through the different phases and building requirements that are tested and validated that you've met them on the other side of this life cycle. So, so, for example, in the architecture development phase, I'm developing the requirements that then are going to be tested, the operational test evaluation and transition. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that also implies I'm also coming up with the requirements for how it's going to be operated and maintained and how it's going to be disposed of. So there's, there's a lot of work that goes in that front end, that first set of requirements, and oftentimes that's the most ill-defined stage. People don't know exactly what they need or what the problems are in enough depth to be able to specify what what solutions are even possible. So, so again, requirements has a role all the way through this life cycle. It's not just at the beginning, at the very top, of that small set of requirements. Um, as again, as you decompose, the number of requirements gets much much larger. So why do I need more in a spreadsheet? Well, I think I've kind of said it. Uh, you know, the pros of a spreadsheet are great. I mean, it's a wonderful tool for dealing with numbers. You know, Excel can perform all kinds of mathematical functions. You can you can add up all the different uh, requirements you have, and you can know, plot things, and that's great. But it doesn't really capture all the information easily without you coming up with what are the bins of information I need. What's my schema? Uh, as we call them, database terms. So what, what are those elements of information I need to capture? How are they related to one another? If you don't have that, it's actually really hard. You have to come up with it all yourself. Uh, by the way, there are some tools that <laughs> make you do that too, which is really painful. <laughs> if you've not ever done that before, it's, it's really a, quite a bit of work. You're almost designing a language. So, so you, that's, a, that's, that's a hard thing to do and do well. Uh, and also, most requirements are not pure numbers. Uh, functional requirements particularly require context. What, what do they mean? How does it work? So it's more than just requirements I need. I need that contextual information. And then the non-functional requirements are often also non-miracle. Uh, things like uh, my favorite is the Navy uh, wants everything painted gray. And painted gray means a certain color shade of gray that you have to paint it. Well, that's a requirement. That's a non-functional requirement that has to be captured. And where do you put that? How do you put that? How do you allocate it to the different components that do need to be painted? Obviously, you don't paint the things inside the box, but you paint the outside of the box. So things like that. Uh, also, spreadsheets are just not databases. They're hard to configuration manage, baseline. Uh, you know, all kinds of other capabilities are very difficult to do with a spreadsheet. You can write the macros, and you can do all those kinds of things, 
But if you do, you're putting a lot of work into something that isn't really getting you to what you're trying to get to, which is understanding the requirements. Uh, also, the spreadsheets are certainly not going to help you with any kind of functional analysis to the simulation capabilities that are needed. And you'll find out in a minute why those are so important. So why are we using spreadsheets for requirements management? Uh, here's some of the reasons I came up with. Uh, it's what I have, right? It's, it's, it's on your desktop. It's, it's here. Uh, and you know how to use it, right? And, and of course, it's cheap. And of course, because everybody has Microsoft Office, we're using Excel. Uh, if, if we use something else, you do some other spreadsheet tool, but that same idea. Uh, your management won't buy anything else. That's a very common problem. And then uh, requirements tools are complicated and expensive. A lot of people feel that way. Again, if you're having to come up with an entire schema by yourself, of what data to even begin to gather, that's a lot of work by itself. So it is complicated. It becomes expensive. Some of the tools are very expensive. Uh, and then you don't want to learn a new tool. Uh, man, a lot of us, we're pretty busy doing our regular job, so why do we have to go learn something else? The problem is, is that you end up with a, a result of very poor quality requirements. And most of us know that the cost of fixing a bad requirement that was developed in the beginning it costs orders of magnitude more at the end. And so that cost often ends up with program cancellations or problems that, that go all the way into the operations and maintenance portion of the problem. So you never really solve the whole problem correctly or completely or cost effectively. So now you've got to go back to the well and do it again. So this ends up being very, very expensive uh, in terms of, and of course, the worst thing is you could be missing important life critical requirements that could that cause failures that end up costing people's lives not just not just money so so you need a tool that results in high quality requirements to perform requirements analysis so that's a key part of it and by analysis we mean actually looking for the quality is it does it have uh, quality attributes like clear complete can I identify that within it and does it have any thing to help me with it? Is there a way to do that? There are so many tools now that will help you read text and help you understand and find indicators of where it lacks clarity. Um, also then you want to support requirements management of course because you've got to have the ability to import the, and export the requirements and of course also configuration management. Um, now functional analysis and simulation is really critical because that's how you're going to learn and understand uh, how good the requirements are. Uh, I, I'll never forget working on a project where um, we were doing a, a missile defense system and somebody uh, basically had a, a, a set of requirements that, that would have ended up requiring you to invent a time machine to make it work. <laughs> In other words, their timings were completely off. And, and we saw that through the modeling simulation that we did that, that helped understand what the problem was. Um, also, you want to track to test results. You want the ability to go and say, okay, here are my requirements at the beginning of the life cycle. Here's what I'm doing at the end to test to them how they how do they fit together, how do they trace together, uh, and they work with that. Another thing that we found is that nobody works by themselves anymore. It's, you need something collaborative. Uh, so something with a commenting capability at least or, or more. Uh, something that will give you indicators of, the, of uh, when other people work in the, in the database and working where you're working. Things like that. And being able to share the databases and the information. And of course scalability. If you're working on any significant project, you can have thousands and thousands of requirements. Well, there's maybe even millions of pieces of information you want to track and, and understand. So it can get that large, if, depending on what the project you're working on. So even for simple projects, you can have thousands pretty easily, pretty quickly. So how can InnoSlate help me help you do this? Well, first of all, I'm going to kind of give you a process that I, I go through when I'm thinking about how I'm going to do requirements. So I start with capturing the originating artifacts. Now, it, it, as I said, in that very early stage, user may not have a lot of stuff that's very specific to the problem. Um, I'll never forget one of the uh, projects we worked on. 
uh, had a requirement, and the top level requirement was $10 million flyaway cost. Great. Well, what else do I need? Well, I need lots of other things for what that system was supposed to do. So, you know, those are kinds of things that you're looking for to, to expand and go beyond. Uh, but, but we want to capture what there is out there, and oftentimes there's policy documents and things like that that help formulate the why behind the mission. What are they doing? Why are they doing what they're doing? Uh, one of the new terms of, of art people are banding, banding around is uh, what's something called mission engineering. But what that really is is looking at the mission as a system and seeing how can we integrate those mission elements and the systems together in a way to do different kinds of missions. And so system engineering actually works extremely well in that space, and I've actually been doing that for over 20 years. Um, so you need something to be able to capture that information and bring it in. And the problem is, is it comes in all kinds of different formats, all kinds of different problems. You know, for people word processing documents, it's very hard to extract the information and make it work well and get it into a database structure. Uh, you have that same problem if you're going into Excel, right? You know, you're trying to bring all this information into Excel from a Word document. It's not trivial to make that conversion. So, so those are things, and particularly also their structure you want to capture in terms of the parent-child relationships. If I have a document, for example, it has numbers usually. It, it's not, it, and it's usually hierarchically numbered, right? One, 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.3, 1 1.4, 1 that kind of thing. So, so that hierarchy gives you that kind of parent-child relationship, and you see it visually, but you also want to make those relationships if you're capturing information separately. And so you can see that and work with it and then focus in on the sections you care about. And so, again, a lot of the tools will do that, and, and InnoSlate definitely has a good way of seeing that. Uh, also, you want to have some way to preview the information before you save it, because if you don't, then you may be bringing junk in your database. So always have a preview capability of some sort. Um, so the next thing I would do after I've captured the basic ones I can find, I, I would then go ahead and quality check them. I will go through and do the analysis. Uh, InnoSlate has a quality checker. It's actually a little button if you see at the top, the middle of the screen, uh, it says quality check. That actually is a natural language processor processing tool that will read the description field and look against eight different criteria to, under, to determine whether or not it's clear, complete, uh, the, the, I forget all the other factors that are in there, but there's eight, eight total that you look at. And that gives you that quality score on the right, you see, where the column with quality score, the green bars and the yellow bars and percentages. So that, that they'll score it and then you, it'll help you identify where the problems are that you can then fix and add and make it, make it uh, better. <clears throat> uh, we also have a, a field for rationale. That's a fairly standard thing to get in, a, in, a, in requirements. You want to capture the rationale behind the requirement. That gives a little bit more of the context and things as well for the requirement. Uh, that, that's, that's often useful to have in that same thing. Um, you want something configurable. This actually can be adjusted. You can see all those different quality factors if you want on this in more like a spreadsheet form. Or when you click on the object, it'll actually show you in the sidebar the different uh, quality factors, and you can work through them that way. I uh, also have labels here, which are ways to organize the information. So, for example, you could separate out your functional requirements from your non-functional requirements, things like that. Um, and, of course, uh, reports. There's a reports button. Every view in InnoSlate has a button for reports, so you just go use that, and that has usually the set of reports you're most interested in for this that particular view you're in. Uh, baselining is another thing you can do. You can document baseline, just pushing the baseline button next to that quality check button at the top. And it lets you visualize the information because you can open and actually get diagrams of this as well. So lots of different ways to see the information and work with it and understand it better and communicate it to your customers. So my step three is then adjust those quality attributes I mentioned and making sure they meet the requirements. You can see the sidebar here with those different things and, and an example there of the complete where it says it contains the word and, which means it's probably maybe uh, more than one requirement in the same uh, requirements. So you got to look at it and say, is that correct or not? 
uh, you know, it, in that particular case, I probably would have said, yes, it's okay. But, you know, it just something lets you do that. And you can add your own checks if you want to. At the bottom, we've got a new check in case you want to have to add one in or add some other things you think are factors you want to look for. Uh, something like uh, maintainability or something like that might be something that you want to look for in, in that you would want to add. Um, anyway, so lots, all these attributes, by the way, can be modified from any other view in the database. So it's all, it's completely driven by the data, the different views. So if you make a change here, it'll make a change in the spider diagram or in the requirements diagram or any other view. So and vice versa. So it's it's a very effective way to work and and uh, capture your information and adjust it. So then, well, I'm going to get to a point where I'm, I'm I either have I have enough information to start developing scenarios to to model and to check and see do they work, or I have to invent these from scratch. And oftentimes, particularly at that architecture level, I'm starting here mostly because I'm trying to come up with well, what is it you're trying to do? How is it trying to work? So the scenarios, and again, people are using all kinds of different terms for this. I've heard threads, use cases, um, what's the, oh, user stories is the new thing. Uh, so all these different things about it. But basically, fundamentally, what you're trying to do is understand, well, how is it the system might be used? And from that, use that to drive the functional requirements in particular. So they, 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 they can validate those user needs and identify the functional requirements associated with them, or you can start from here even if, if your customer doesn't have much and start here with them and help them understand, well, what's your business? What are you trying to do? What's your job? And then once you start modeling that, you do the as-is modeling and then go back and see, well, what, how can I fix things, where are problems are, where are bottlenecks and things. Um, also, this is a good thing to use in that early phase as a concept operations document. And this is actually a picture of our, of our CONOPS document in the tool. Uh, we actually have a documents view, so you can author and develop all your documents within the tool. That saves a lot of time and energy and money uh, trying, to, trying to put all the information together. You can also link pictures in here within the tool, uh, hyperlinks. There's just a lot of capability within to create your documentation directly within the tool. Um, model and verify scenarios. So again, here's a place where you can uh, mod do the modeling, and this is a visual model we call an action diagram at the top there. Uh, we have other types of diagrams you may be more familiar with, an IDEF0, uh, activity diagrams. Again, lots of other functional diagrams are available for you to work with, sequence diagrams, on and on. Um, so, so that's available to you. We found this to be a very easy one for people to understand and work with, and it's more uh, complete because it has the ability also to show resources. So you can tie the resources in, uh, and I also can do allocation of, 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 the, of the functional elements in here right with that branch asset uh, allocation capability. So this is a very robust doc diagram and also, though, it's fairly easy to see and use, and most of the customers that we show this to feel comfortable they understand it. And that's been a lot of the difficulty we've had in the past with many other kind of diagrams is people don't understand the limitations. For example, an IDEF0 was a common diagram used. has lots of lines. looks like there's a lot of flow, but it's all data flow. It's not functional sequencing. And so that causes a lot of trouble for people. They think and they create things that are just simply a serial process instead of recognizing the natural parallelness of, of the model. And so this, this lets you do more of that kind of activity. So what's nice is since I can tie uh, input outputs, I, and I can constrain those input outputs to, to the pipes they flow over, I can also, uh, I'm allocating against different things that can do the job, so I can have resources as well that then can be adjusted. From that, we can actually create all the constraints to obtain not only the functional requirements, which the individual boxes give me, but also the non-functional performance requirements. And in particular, I can also model the cost schedule and performance of all these things. So 
So looking at with the simulators that are built in, and there's a discrete event simulator, this is showing you the output here at the box boxes down below as uh, the diagram in execution. And then there's a, it's a resources over time being changed. Uh, there's also a cost number that's being tracked up in the top right middle and then uh, the time as well. And of course, below is the Gantt chart that gets formed from it. So uh, we find this to be extremely useful for systems modeling, but it's also useful for project management. It actually has, you're doing almost the same kind of things. You're just using your business processes. This is the business process of launching a satellite. You have other business processes you can model just exactly the same way, and it works extremely well. So from that, you can generate those lower level requirements. And we have from that model an actual selection feature where you can select and generate functional requirements. And it'll actually create the document below in our requirements view, like we started with. Same idea. You can, you can analyze it, you can baseline it, uh, and publish those requirements as a baseline and work with those as a, again, that as a, as a document. And so now I'm great. I, I'm, this is how I'm going from the models to requirements at the lower level. So again, I started at the high level, extracting what I could from the user needs. Now I'm going through done the analysis and derive the functional requirements at that next level down. So you can see how this can iterate and work through. Uh, and of course, verification requirements are something you might want to be doing in parallel with this. Some people think the requirements itself should be have all the uh, verification information. Other people feel that, that you should have a verification requirement separate because it talks more, more about the how you're going to verify things. And so uh, a lot of times people will separate the two. Again, it depends on the complexity of your system and how best you'd like to work. Uh, we have both options available to you. Uh, this is an example of taking those kind of verification requirements and we trace them back to test cases and things like that. Uh, in fact, here's our test facility where we can do their test center where we take and capture all the different kinds of tests and then link them back. Now this lets you capture not only the expected results but also the actual results. So the expected results should be all part of your planning, your test planning that you're doing in that early phase. But if you think about it, you're also then, then you could now take the results and just line it right up and execute the tests in the later phase. So you see how this can really speed up that whole life cycle. You no longer have to take uh, months to years to do something. You can literally do this much, much quicker. And so, uh, this, so this could be used in an agile environment. If you're trying to do agile, this would be a way for you to derive your functional requirements and then do your, you do your, uh, your code development or whatever else you're doing and then take, get your test results and have it all linked together in a place you can see it. Uh, also, we do have a test plan as part of our, um, our actual uh, documents view as well. So that's another option for you to work with and create that directly within the tool. And finally, you want to make sure everything's connected to each other. So we give you a lot of ways to do that. There's a spider diagram at the, at the, at the top right. You see those are the relationships it shows between it. You can uh, drag new things onto this picture and then make connections between things and create new relationships. Uh, that's a way to get the, all the different kinds of relationships from one place. If you know what relationship you're interested in, like the verifies, I'm looking for my verification requirements and seeing what test verifies what. The, the middle picture showing you the matrix with the X boxes does that. Again, those X's are actually create the relationship between the two things. And the individual objects of information, again, if you click on them, the sidebar shows you all that information and attributes about them. So again, all can be modified right here. In both cases, you, that sidebar will, will save your life. You, you can literally do anything you want with it. The other thing you can do is also get a report. You can get the RBTM report and other types of reports out of this as well, showing all those linkages and so how you've met the requirements. Now, obviously, that's a lot of work, <laughs> but but the job's a lot of work, so that's okay. That's why they that's why they employ us. That's why we have jobs. So it's okay. That's not bad. 
But the tool helps you take care of some of that, you know, difficulty of getting started, uh, which, you know, coming up with a schema and all those kinds of factors. A lot of that's already available to you. You just probably, you might modify it slightly. But I think you'll find that most of the information you're looking to capture is within that schema. And then you can uh, take that information very quickly and work with it. And there's a lot of help in the tool to do things uh, for documentation. So uh, again, let you go through those steps as you need to, to go down to the level you need to get to where you can decide what to buy or build. And so <clears throat> that's the key is to stop when you have that selection criteria. Oftentimes today, uh, I, I say, well, you know, if I, if I have a, uh, if I can identify commercial off the shelf items that go with that, I'm probably close to stopping. I certainly don't want to over specify. Uh, I, I just need enough information to decide what commercial off the shelf information, uh, software or hardware I need to go buy. Or, and that's what you're looking for is those selection criteria for that. So that's a good place to stop. And then, of course, you go through that integration verification process using the, the B test center. Again, as I mentioned, bring in your actual results as you go. And then use the documentation tools to show that you've done that. And, oh, by the way, there's lots of other features in the tool like intelligence. Intelligence goes through and reads your model, checks for good modeling quality, uh, making sure you're doing the right kinds of things, uh, risk matrices and all kinds of other tools. So you, 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 it gives you an ability to do the complete picture. Now, a lot of people say, oh, gosh, that's going to be awful expensive. No, it's not, actually. All, having all this capability integrated together in one place actually makes it very inexpensive. It reduces your labor costs significantly. And in fact, the cost of the tool is very low. We estimate that it's about a tenth the cost of what it would take you to take all the different tools you'd have to put together to do this work. So, so it's, ob it's obviously, it's not, is it as cheap as a spreadsheet tool? No. But is it, is it, is, does it give you everything you need? Yes. And so it's, you can make a very good cost effective argument by picking up this tool. So just in summary, um, and we have uh, requirements analysis is a critical part of requirements management. Modeling simulation are, are critical to ensuring you have the requirements you need and are developing systems that work. And to be successful in moving from spreadsheets to model-based systems engineering, you need help from your process and your tool. And, and in the slate can be that tool for you to help you do that. Uh, and of course, you, you know you, you're successful when your systems gets fielded ahead of schedule and under budget. It's always a goal. It's rarely achieved, but you can do it with this. And of course, you know, request a live demo. We can show you the demo, show you, get you into the tool a little bit more in depth and help you get through it. Um, so Elizabeth, I'm kind of done with the slides. Uh, are there any specific questions we have yet? Uh, thanks, Dr. Dan. We've received a few questions already. If you haven't done so, please send your questions to the panel on the right. Dr. Dan will answer as many questions as you can before our time is up. Um, our first question is, um, how can I customize attributes? So um, the, the, uh, there's a schema extender in the tool as well that lets you add new attributes to it or hide attributes. So one of the things you may find when you first get into the tool, you say, oh, wow, this does so much. I don't want to do this much or I don't want to get too many people confused. Uh, just hide a bunch of the th features of it. And that way, people won't have as much of a problem getting into it and getting started. So that's, that's a great way to do it. But yes, you can certainly add attributes very easily. Um, our next question is, what's the best way to link requirements? Uh, the best way to link requirements, I think, uh, again, is that the, either the spider diagram or the, uh, what we call the hierarchical comparison matrix. Again, if I know exactly the requirement, uh, exactly the uh, the uh, relationship I want to link with, and I'm trying to link a bunch of things at once, it's the matrix. If I'm kind of working and just kind of flowing and working with it, this, the, the spider diagram is more powerful. It actually can do more different types of relationships very quickly for you. And, and by the way, when you bring something in, into that picture and you drag the line into a, the other box, it'll tell you what relationships are valid. <laughs> so you don't even have to guess. <laughs> for the most part. 
Our next question is, can a software integrate with SysML? So in fact, we produce all the SysML diagrams. Uh, so we don't have to integrate the SysML, we have SysML as output. Because uh, that's just a visualization of the information. So we, we capture all the nine diagrams that are in SysML, uh, including the parametric diagram if you want. And so all that's available uh, right out of the box. Our next question is, how does NSLate tool compare to doors, et cetera? Uh, there's really no comparison. Uh, this is, this is uh, a light year ahead. Uh, basically, what you have is, uh, with do in doors is more of a spreadsheet kind of approach to the tool. It's a very similar kind of thing. You get no, none of the diagrams, none of that diagrammatic access. You get none of the functional analysis and simulation. You don't have a test center. You have to build the ontology from scratch. Uh, to me, if I got, had the choice between doing, using doors or using a spreadsheet, I'd use the spreadsheet. It's a heck of a lot cheaper. Our next question is, could you talk briefly about how risk management is handled in Innisly? So, in fact, uh, we have risk management and the risk matrix right now, uh, and it's, uh, it's available. It's all integrated with this, and, and you do that risk analysis as you go through. Uh, I see also in the question is about a risk burn down visualization feature. We don't have that at the moment, but that is something we're working on. And if it's something you're interested in, like any other new feature in the tool, there's on the dashboard, there's a, a place where there's a send feedback. And that feedback form is, is intended to tell us what's important to you. And so we're always looking for inputs from the users to tell us what they care about and what they want to see in the next version of the tool. And we're always adding new features. Uh, this year we've had, I would say, I believe it was six point releases. And each time we added major new features. You can go on to the website, the innoslate.com website, and you can go see what our releases have been uh, from day one. And you can see the kind of changes we've made over the last few years. Any other questions? Our next question is, what is the cost? Does it depend on the number of users? Um, see if you let me get this one. Um, yeah. If you go to innoslate.com slash pricing, we have our Innoslate cloud pricing and our Innoslate enterprising available there. Um, it does depend on number of users. We offer volume discounts. Um, it start, we start at $49 a month per user. Um, our next question is, how does it compare to core MBSE tool? So, so Core is a tool I actually used for many years, and it was Core was a great tool uh, for its time. But unfortunately, it hasn't evolved to the level where we are. Uh, it's missing a lot of the kind of features we're, we're talking about. The visualization risk, for example, is a good one. Uh, the the requirements uh, view, having a, a very detailed way to do that. Quality checking isn't there, um, so you have none of those kinds of things in, in requirements. Uh, the, the simulation we have includes not only discrete event, but, but Monte Carlo. So that, again, that's a big one. And of course, test center. So, so lots of features that are not in core. Uh, again, core, core is a great tool for its time, but it's, a, it's also a desktop tool, whereas we're a cloud-based tool. So we're using all the modern technologies and modern techniques uh, that you expect from a web-based tool. And <clears throat> by the way, something I, I should mention is that if you do classified work, please see us offline. We have all kinds of solutions to anything in your classified arena that have government clouds that we can connect you with, and you can use the features there. Our next question is, does FDA recognize this tool, say, in FDA audits? Um, not that I know of, because we already haven't had much interaction with people at the FDA, but we Again, we'd be glad to go talk to them with you, if you'd like even, and show them what we do. And I think they could see very quickly how this could help them with that kind of work. Uh, we are certainly looking in that area as a place to expand. We've started mostly in the aerospace arena, uh, but we are extending out into the medical and other areas. Uh, so FDA is certainly uh, uh, on our list. So. Our next question is, assuming none are written yet, do you recommend writing requirements in Word, then importing, or is it advantageous to pen them directly in Innisfree? 
I think there's a huge advantage to paying them directly into InnoSlate because, again, Word can't do any of that quality checking and things like that for you as you go. I mean, it, it has a nice grammar checker, which I do appreciate, but much of that is built into the web browsers already. And so we have all the, the spell check and, and grammar check features that are in Word essentially are in, in the InnoSlate uh, by using a Chrome browser or any of the modern browsers. Uh, and, but what this lets you do is then deal with each requirement as an object, and you can track it and work with it separately, uh, and it lets you take that stream of thought. You can go through and say, oh, wait a minute, that, 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 that uh, requirement may cause a risk, and now I can bring my risk analysis and tie that together immediately right there. And so there's, there's huge advantages, I think, to working in, in InnoSlate. And I think you'll find it has all the rich text features you need to do what you're doing. Uh, I mean, we have subscripting, superscripting, uh, you know, I bold italics, all the kinds of stuff you're used to using in any kind of a word tool. Our next question is, is there a way for non-users to see a view-only version of the requirements, <clears throat> et cetera, for a team members outside of systems engineering? Yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. And in fact, we have a, uh, one of our, uh, we call it the reviewer tool. It is free, and it is used. On the, it's free on the cloud. Uh, there are other things we can do with enterprise and things like that to help you use it. Uh, I'm not sure it's exactly free on some of those other clouds, but on on the actual Google Cloud, which is our primary cloud-based tool, we have that reviewer free, and it's available for anybody to go pick it up and use it. Our next question is: Does each requirement have a unique ID? Yes. Yes, they do, and uh, it is captured, and it's actually shown in the in the tool on the sidebar. It shows up what that unique identifier is, um, and in fact, we use those as a way to uh, navigate uh, to the different views of, of a piece of information. Our next question is: Do you have a, a RVTM report? Yes, RVTM. Uh, and, and half dozen others, or RTM, RVM, RSM. <laughs> so yeah, there's there's a lot of those kind of reports available, automatic, right in the tool, built in. You can also find a full list of reports at help.anslate.com. Um, that's all the questions that we have for now. If you have any more questions, please feel free to reach out to us after this webinar. We'd like to thank you again for joining us for today's webinar. We'll be sending an email announcement for our next webinar, so be sure to keep an eye out for it in your inbox. As always, we will also send the recording and slide deck to everyone that attended today. For more resources, we encourage you to visit our website and our blog, as well as connect with us on social media. That concludes today's presentation. Thank you again for your attendance, and we hope to see you again at our next webinar in September. Please enjoy the rest of your day.